Great. OK, well, I'll get started. Um, I think last time a few people came in um, after I'd started, but that's fine. Um, brilliant. Let me just share my screen. Great. OK, good afternoon, everybody. My name's Miriam. Thank you so much for joining me for this workshop. Um, you never know how many people are going to come, so it's really nice that you've chosen to come. And obviously, there was so much choice, so many good ones. Um, but yeah, it's a real privilege to be here and to share with you. So I'll start by introducing myself. Um, I began my career um, as a teacher um, in Leeds in an area of extreme social deprivation. Um, I went on to be a teacher for seven, eight years in various schools in Leeds and in Sheffield. And it was through teaching that I first came face to face with the issue of child poverty through seeing the impact that it had on children's learning. Um, I began to feel more and more strongly about the fact that schools needed to be doing more to support children. Now, that's not a criticism of schools in any way, but simply a recognition of the huge amount of pressure, both financial and time pressure that schools are under. Um, often schools simply do not have time to meet all of children's emotional and physical needs when they quite rightly need to prioritise the academic needs. I moved out of the classroom to working more directly to support vulnerable children in my role as a school partner for the National School Breakfast Programme. And that is a government funded um, project uh, run by two charities and we support schools in disadvantaged communities across England to improve access to a healthy breakfast. And in addition, I also work for TLG, that stands for Transforming Lives for Good. And we're a charity that helps to bring a hope and a future to struggling children. Um, and I work on two programmes, one that supports children's emotional and mental health through one-to-one -one coaching, and another that tackles child poverty through holiday hunger provision. And I'll talk more about those um, a bit later on. Okay, so today's agenda. Um, I'd like to begin by talking about what child poverty is and how we define poverty. Um, I'll here be drawing on lots of research by the Joseph Roundtree Foundation, who are one of the leading expert bodies on poverty. Um, and I'll just say, whenever I use a, st a statistic, um, I will reference briefly where that came from. But if you want a full list of the reports and things and my sources um, supplied by email, I'm really happy to do that. Um, secondly, we'll move on to looking at the picture of UK child poverty um, and specifically how these figures look before COVID. And then thirdly, we'll talk about the impact of COVID because as you can imagine, that's, that's had a big impact. And finally, we'll move on to talk about what you can do about it. I'll be making some practical suggestions about how you can support your local communities. Um, and um, there'll be some interactive parts of today's workshop. So if you've got a pen and paper, there'll be times where I've asked you to write stuff down. There'll be times where I'll ask you to type in the chat box. Um, but yeah, it'd be great to have you involved as well. Okay, so here's the first chance for you to get involved. Can you summarise in one tweet how you would define UK poverty? So if you're unfamiliar with Twitter, uh, tweets, 280 characters, 50 words, so about one or two sentences. How would you define UK poverty? And obviously I'm saying UK because I'm differentiating it from say third world poverty. So I'll just give you a second, to scribble something down. Great. Is there anyone who's brave enough to unmute themselves and read out their definition? I'm happy to do that. Great. Thank you. To me, it's not having sufficient food and not having warm clothing and footwear and not having a bed to sleep in and a, a nice roof over your head. Basics. 
Yeah, I'm really sure there's a lot more, but basics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're all really important things. Um, absolutely, the physical things. I've got a definition here from the Joseph Roundtree Foundation. Um, they say poverty means not being able to heat your home, pay your rent or buy the essentials for your children. So what you just said, a lot of that. It means waking up every day facing insecurity, uncertainty and impossible decisions about money. It means facing marginalisation and even discrimination because of your financial circumstances. So it's absolutely all the physical things that somebody might not have. But I think we're also being challenged here to think about how it might make a person feel marginalised, discriminated against, uncertainty. Could also impact mental health in that sense, couldn't it? Okay, great. This slide here shows a really interesting pictogram from the Joseph Roundtree Foundation, who I'll refer to as the JRF from now on, just to save time. Now, what this shows us is that there are different levels of poverty. And that's one of the main things I'd like you to take away from today. As you can see, um, the green bit at the top of the house in the roof is people who live above the MIS. The MIS is important. It means the minimum income standard. Now, the JRF created this minimum income standard as the recommended minimum amount that a household needs to live on and able to be afford in, in order to be able to afford a decent standard of living and participate in society. Now, the MIS is widely used among sociologists and other bodies in defining poverty. Actually, it's what the government uses to work out what the minimum wage should be. So this is sort of the, the minimum standard. Now, to be in the green bit, you need to be able to afford that decent standard of living over time. So it's not hanging in the balance month to month, but each month you're getting by, you're able to afford the things that you need to participate in society in a socially acceptable way. Now, those who live in the yellow section, a household living on sort of between 75% and 99% of the minimum income standard, um, are probably getting by month to month. But these people are unlikely to have any kind of savings, any kind of safety net, and therefore unexpected costs can cause problems. These families I've often heard referred to as JAM families, JAM standing for just about managing. And in my experience, these are often the families that schools in particular worry about. Um, their poverty may be more hidden because they can usually manage. They often won't qualify for things like free school meals. They probably don't receive any kind of state or charity funded support. But if there's a change in income, so say mum's zero hour contract didn't give her enough shifts this week, or dad was ill so he couldn't drive the taxi. This can cause immediate problems for that family. Now families in the orange and red categories have a household income of 75% or below the MIS. And, and I think this is what a lot of us probably think about as, as poverty. Um, those in the bottom section are living in destitution, so real severe poverty. Um, but I, I just sort of wanted to draw attention particularly to that yellow one because I think that that category is the one that people maybe aren't aware of or can get missed. Now many call for the government to guarantee that MIS to all households. It's worth saying at this point that being on benefits doesn't guarantee the minimum income standard. Um, a 2020 report from the JRF shows that working families who have two parents working full time and receiving tax credit usually still have an income below the minimum income standard. If you're a single parent, even if you're working full time, your income is likely to be below the minimum income standard. For those on universal credit, um, your income could be as low as 39% below the MIS or for those on legacy benefits, which is what we had before universal credit came in, could be as much as 42% below the MIS. So, um, you know, it's worth saying that benefits don't necessarily guarantee that. Um, I'll later go on to talk a bit more about the picture of child poverty in the UK and, and how many children are in these different categories. Great. So right now, I'd like you to get involved. Um, I want you to think about what could be the main causes of poverty. Have a think and type some of them into the chat box. 
Um, now, just to say, people in the last workshop were concerned because it says you're typing to everyone. You're only typing to people in this breakout room. It's not going to go to the whole conference. Don't worry about that. So have a think. Type into the chat box for me what you think are the main causes of child poverty. And it doesn't matter if we get repetition, if people say the same ones, that's fine. Great. Thank you. Let's see what people are saying. Unemployment. Yeah, a few people are saying unemployment. Great. Illness. Yeah. Substance abuse. Generational poverty. That's an interesting one. Yeah. No one said that one earlier. Great. Thank you. Okay. Well, I've got some um, causes here for you. I wonder if it's the same um, as what you put. Let me have a look. Okay. Um, unemployment or insecure employment, obviously probably that's the main one that comes to mind. Um, now, interestingly, unemployment isn't actually as big a cause of poverty as, as we might think. Um, it's definitely, you know, a big one, but um, actually more people are affected by insecure employment. 72% um, of children living in poverty have working parents. So, I think it's important for us to get our head around the fact that a lot of people, 72%, a lot of people facing poverty um, are working. Um, so often the cause can be low paid or insecure employment, like I mentioned before about, um, you know, things like zero hour contracts. Lack of skills um, or education. Obviously, this can mean that we don't have um, access to the 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 better kinds of employment, the higher paid or the more secure types of employment. The benefit system can be a cause of poverty, like I said before. High living costs cause poverty as well. You know, obviously, particularly in certain areas, you're looking at um, high rental costs, um, high childcare costs, fuel costs, etc. And um, something I've had highlighted to me recently is that being poor often means that you don't have access to like the good value tariffs or the low interest rate um, or the or, or, or your rental options are limited or you you end up having to go to you know um payday lender so being poor can mean that you have higher living costs than people who aren't poor which is ironic family breakdown can cause poverty somebody said before generational poverty so sort of not being able to get out of that cycle um, if you don't, you know, if you if you don't know anybody who's worked, it might be harder for you to find work. You don't have that encouragement. What about if your family was your employer? What about if your family was your safety net? And they provided for you when when money was tight and that and that goes away. Abuse, trauma and chaotic lifestyle, like somebody said before, drug addiction obviously makes it hard to, to hold down employment. Sudden change in circumstances, that's a real big one. 87% um, of clients from Christians Against Poverty, the debt charity, have struggled with one or more significant difficulties on top of their debt. So something else going wrong, a sudden change. Um, and discrimination as well, of course, because discrimination um, could mean that you don't have access to the good employment or the cheaper housing or whatever else. So I'm sure you guys have thought had lots of those um, and they're similar to what you said. Okay, little quiz now. I want you to write down the answers scribble on a piece of paper. Um, so let's get a bit more specific. What do these figures show us about children in the UK who are actually living in poverty? Um, first question, how many children currently live in poverty in the UK? Write down what figure, I'll give you a clue. It's in the millions. I wonder what you put. It's 4.2 million. And in fact, this was that's a figure from pre-COVID. That's the government's figure for 2018 to 2019. We haven't got last year's figure published yet. That's actually 30% 
of children living in the UK. So if you picture a classroom, that's nine children out of a classroom of 30 who live in poverty. Question two, one in five children said that their main worry was what? What do you think one in five children said their main worry was? This was um, a survey carried out last year by the Children's Commissioner. And one in five children said that their main worry was not having enough money. Um, research really shows that children are acutely aware of their own poverty. Um, children who, who don't have enough money to live on are usually, usually do know about it. Okay, and the third question. How many children are estimated to live in households classed as destitute? So we know we've got 4.2 million children overall in poverty, but do you remember that red bar at the bottom of the pictogram? The destitution, the real severe poverty. How many children do you think are in that category? It was 500,000. Half a million children living in households that the JRF define as not being able to afford to eat, keep clean, stay warm and stay dry. I wonder if you found those statistics quite shocking. It's very sad, isn't it? Um, the truth is that the, this report that I mentioned from the Children's Commissioner um, it's actually published just early this year, shows that children are the group of the population most likely to be in poverty. So more so than middle-aged people or, or elderly people, children are the most likely to be in poverty as a group. And that's been rising, that number's been rising for nearly a decade. Okay, I imagine that you won't be surprised to hear that child poverty has increased as a result of the coronavirus crisis. Both the Social Mobility Commission and the Resolution Foundation forecast that there will be an additional 1 million children in relative poverty between 2022 and 2024. Um, a sort of on the ground statistic that I've got, Magic Breakfast, a charity um, that supports schools, asked their school staff whether they thought poverty had increased in this last year through the pandemic. 69% of staff said that they thought poverty had got worse in their school community. Why has it got worse? Well, COVID has caused um, a lot of change in circumstances. Um, there are over 3 million children living in households that have had a change in earnings in this past year. You know, if you think about furlough, that could be a 20% de decrease in income. If that's just the one parent, it could be more if it's two parents. Um, those who've been made redundant or put out of work, if they go on to universal credit, their income could decrease by as much as 50%. Um, this report that I'm talking about from the Social Market Foundation found that of children entering the category of very low food insecurity, 61% of them had parents whose wages had fallen, 44% had parents whose working hours had been cut, 24% had parents that had lost a job. So actually, again, it's that thing that um, insecure employment can be a bigger cause than losing your job. It can, it can create even more poverty. Um, the Department for Work and Pensions have actually just published a figure, 51% increase they saw in the number of families with children claiming universal credit since the start of the pandemic. So 50% increase in families with kids going on to universal credit. Now we know that the government gave a 20% uplift in the universal credit weekly amount over the period of the pandemic, which is great. And Rishi Sunak announced this week that that's gonna be extended for a further six months, which was really good news, but it is unfortunately temporary. We, we um, at TLG are campaigning for that to be made permanent as are many other charities. Um, both the Resolution Foundation and the Children's Commissioner's reports felt that by taking that £20 uplift away, it will ca cause far more children to go into poverty. In fact, they've estimated it to be as many as 730,000 more children entering poverty if that £20 uplift is taken away. Okay. 
I'd like to take the opportunity here um, to zoom in on food poverty in particular. Um, now this, for want of a better phrase, is a bit of an area of specialism for me. I work with two charities who are looking to tackle food insecurity and the way that that affects children specifically. Now food insecurity is a general good indicator of poverty. In some ways it can be foolish to separate out types of poverty, you know, food poverty, fuel poverty, rural poverty, because you know, you, you don't really get people sitting in their house um, with a fridge full of food, freezing cold. Normally people are struggling with both. But we do know, um, based on key findings from ENUF, the Evidence and Network on UK Household Food Insecurity, that for most people, the food bill is the most flexible bill that you have. You know, for most of us, our rent or our mortgage, our mobile phone bill, our um, uh, heating bill is probably the same every month. And we, we can't ask for it to be less. Um, it's sort of set in stone. But our food bill is where we can cut back. So a fluctuation in income in a household is often facilitated by cutting back on food. Um, so this is why for many families facing food poverty, sorry, facing poverty, food will be the thing that they are forced to limit. Um, so let's take a closer look at the picture of food insecurity in the UK. Um, just to say, these aren't government statistics. The government doesn't have statistics um, on food insecurity for last year. They won't be published um, for a little while yet, but these are, these are figures from various charity reports. If you take a look at that map on the right hand side of the screen, um, that's from a report done by the Social Market Foundation. Um, the darker areas, put simply, are where there is a higher concentration of children facing food insecurity. Um, and the lighter areas, there are fewer children facing food insecurity. Now, obviously, if you were going to zoom in, there'll be pockets within those areas where it's worse or where it's better. But I just thought that might be a good indicator for you, depending on where in the country you are. Now, that's also an interactive map. Um, so if you go on their website, the, the, the name of the reports on the right there, if you go on their website, you can click on the map and, and zoom into your area and see what the figures are like. But some more statistics for you on food insecurity. One in four. This is the number of young people in the UK facing some kind of food deprivation. I'll, I'll zoom in in a second on, on what types. There are different types of food deprivation. 2.3 million. This is the number of children who the Food Foundation reported were living in households facing food insecurity in the first six months of the pandemic. 95%, that's a number from the Trussell Trust, um, who are one of the largest network of food bank providers. Now that's the number, that's the increase actually in parcels given out to households with children in April 2020 compared with the previous year, a 95% increase in parcels they were giving to families with children. Um, and they said that the families with children was the household group who were having the highest increase in demand. So again, it's, it's hitting children the hardest. 16%. This is the proportion of parents that said that their children may do with smaller portions, had to skip meals or went a day without eating between March and September. It might be helpful here if you think about your street. Um, Take a street with 50 houses on it. That's about how many are on my street. Think about 16%. That means eight houses on my street where there are children skipping meals. When you put it like that, I just think we can't be okay with that. Okay, I said I'd zoom in on different types of food insecurity. So here's some of the different types. Relying on a few kinds of low cost food, not being able to afford a balanced meal, not eating enough, cutting the size of a meal, skipping meals, going a whole day without eating or completely going hungry. These are different ways that, that food insecurity might affect children. Um, now, I just wanted to say here that um, research from the Child Poverty Action Group, this won't surprise you. Um, evidence shows us that parents in low income households often go to extreme lengths to provide for their children, going without basic necessities such as enough to eat, 
in order that their children do not go hungry. So I just wanted to say, um, this is not about parents eating their fill and then asking their child to skip a meal. Where a parent is having to ask their child to skip a meal, we know that the parent has probably been doing so for some time and that that's quite an extreme length to have to go to to, to um, limit the amount of food that your child can have. Okay, I wonder if you might be thinking about this as we discuss those stats on food insecurity. What about food banks? You know, we've got them. Aren't they doing their job? Well, the answer is food banks are an extremely important resource that many in the UK rely on. But let's not forget, they're an emergency short term solution. They require a referral usually from an official body. So to go to a food bank, you need your social worker or your other the teacher at your child's school um, or, you know, a council worker to refer you to it. So you can't just walk up usually and ask for food. Um, most food banks limit how many times you can come back or how often you can come back. So it's not a long term solution. Um, and also most food banks are only able to supply dried and tinned food, not fresh. So it's that thing again about um, not being able to, to afford balanced meals and limiting the types of food that you can eat. So food banks are brilliant. They're really important. We should absolutely, you know, it's brilliant how many churches and schools provide food banks, but they're not an, a long term answer to the problem of food insecurity. OK, or maybe you were thinking, what about free school meals? You know, these, these kids, they're getting a, a free school lunch. And absolutely, that's brilliant, and they are. But remember I said 4.2 million children in poverty? Well, only 1.4 million children in the UK are eligible for free school meals. And now that has increased a lot, and, and free school meals are really important. They're a lifeline for many families, but unfortunately they are not enough to stop children from going hungry. And I'm gonna give you five reasons why not. Number one, it's only lunch. Many schools report, I've had head teachers say this directly to me, that they know there are children who for their free school lunch is their only hot and regular meal. And they might be missing out on the other two meals. Number two, it's only in term time, as we know. Children are only at school 39 of the 52 weeks of the year. And the rest of the time, that free school meal isn't provided. Number three, many of those jam families, remember I said just about managing, don't qualify for free school meals. I had a head teacher tell me that her free school meals children were actually her most well off children because they were the ones that qualified. It was the other ones she was worried about. This is a interesting statistic. 60% of children classified as very low food insecurity do not report receiving free school meals. So 60% of those who really struggle with food security don't receive a free school meal. So that tells you either the take up is not as high as it should be or there's a problem with targeting the right people. And fifthly, children in the category, it's an official category, there's no recourse to public funds. Now that's um, adults who have limited leave to enter or remain in the UK. So they might be students, they might be visa overstayers, they might be asylum seekers, they might be asylum seekers who've um, exhausted their appeals. Both they and their dependents do not qualify for any kind of government support, including free school meals. And, and I just think, you know, whatever your political views about somebody overstaying their visa, it shouldn't be their children, should it, who um, are impacted by that. Now, during COVID, rightly so the government um, stopped that policy they said that children with no recourse to public funds could have a free school meal but they have said that that's temporary and it'll go back to the old system okay we know that the take of free school meals isn't always what we'd like it to be and if you consider the barriers to this you might see why um, applying for free school meals require, requires firstly that the child is actually enrolled at and attending school it requires paperwork to be filled out, which demands a certain level of English. It also requires that parents actually want it. And um, lots of schools have told me that there's stigma around accepting free school meals because of how it could look to others. 
Now, those of us who work in and with schools know that many, many schools bend over backwards to ensure take up happens. They'll offer to assist with translation of the form. They'll run competitions where your entry is your free school meal application, so on. But take a look at this table again from the Social Market Foundation, which indicates to us the uptake of different forms of assistance available to people who may be facing food insecurity. So the pale pink bar shows um, the people who did not use this form as a, of assistance, free school meals, breakfast club, holiday club, food bank. Actually, you can see that a few, a smaller number of people took it up to those who didn't take it up. Um, I'd really be interested to know your response to this graph. You know, what does that make you think? Because um, why is take up low? What, what do we need to do better? Do we need to do better on stigma? I don't have the answer to that question, but I think it's a really important thing for us to be thinking about. Okay, we've talked a lot about child poverty. We know the problem, we know that it's bad, and we know it's not going away anytime soon. So what can we do? I'm not here to give you political opinions about benefits, universal credit, there's a big debate on how aid should be administered. You know, should we provide, be providing more funding to the charities that support these people? Um, should we be, you know, more voucher schemes, more food banks? Or should we just be increasing the minimum wage and guaranteeing a basic income level to people so that they don't need to go to a food bank or access a charity or whatever else? And, and that's a complex debate. Um, I don't have time to debate that now. I'll let you think what you will about that. But what I will say is that right here, right now, we know there are children going hungry. We know there are children, um, like the person who shared before said, who don't have a bed. Um, there are so many ways we can support children and families affected by poverty right here, right now. Um, I'm also not here to make a theological case about why we have a duty as Christians to support those facing child poverty. Um, I suspect you're here because you already care about this and you already know some stuff about it. Um, but it, you know, Chris shared earlier, didn't he, um, about how this should be a real priority for us as Christians and how the Bible commands us to do something about it. And I love this verse um, from John 15. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. We can't even begin to comprehend how, what it means to love somebody um, as much as God loves us, but, but we know that we can start um, with real practical ways. There's a quote here from Nicky Gumbel, who you've probably heard of. He leads the HTB network of churches. And he was writing in the Times newspaper in December. And he said, there is so much to be done to help those in need at this time whether it is providing emergency food, comforting the lonely, delivering medical supplies, or simply bringing reassurance, kindness, and hope to those who are struggling. The government must play its part, but it cannot provide the personal support that is also needed. Churches have the local connections to provide volunteers on the ground who will be ready to help at this critical time. There are more churches than pubs in the UK, each representing a web of relationships that stretches through the streets and housing estates that surround them. I love that quote and he sums up so well what I just really passionately believe that the church is uniquely positioned to be able to support people who need it particularly those facing poverty. I've got five words on the right hand side of your screen the church is a network of volunteers with massive skill set all different types of skills among the people in our churches. The church has resources. It has financial resources. And I know a lot of churches are struggling right now, but it might also have church halls and gardens and PA systems and big screens. The church is local. Like Nikki said, there's more churches than pubs in the UK and the church is able to reach out to every street, every housing estate. And as long as we've got proper safeguarding measures in place, the church has reach beyond um, what a charity, what a council worker can do. Um, 
what I mean by that is when you work for a charity and you're providing intervention, usually um, a charity will say provide an intervention for six weeks, 12 weeks, maybe not much longer than that. And at the end of that time, the person who's been working with that family to support them can't contact them again. You know, that's that's not professional, is it? Um, but with the church, we can simply meet people where they are. We can provide friendship. We can pop around for a couple. We can send them a text. We've got so much to offer our communities. Um, and I just want to say, I know that in a massive, massive way, we already are. I'm not here to say that the church isn't doing enough. I'm here to say um, that if you want to do more, here's how you can. So, how you can get involved. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the two charities um, that I work for, and they're both doing great work to support those affected by child poverty. The first is Magic Breakfast. Did you know that before COVID, 1.8 million children were arriving at school too hungry to learn. So they hadn't had breakfast before they came to school and then they can't concentrate, they can't focus. And you can only imagine how that could have got worse um, with the impact of COVID-19. Now I work on a government funded charity project um, called the National School Breakfast Programme, NSBP. And it's run by those two charities, Family Action and Magic Breakfast jointly. Um, and then there's also Magic Breakfast as an independent, privately funded charity, not a government project, um, who do the same, same thing, basically. Um, and what we do is for schools who are eligible, we have breakfast food delivered to them. Um, and then they can distribute that to any child in their school who needs a breakfast. And usually they just give it to every child in the school um, to avoid any stigma. So it's not just for free school meals, children, for any child um, in the school. And the impact it has on children honestly is phenomenal i can't tell you how often i've been told by the teachers the head teachers the inclusion staff about the difference that providing a free breakfast makes to children and how before this support they would have had children come in with rumbly tummies who couldn't concentrate and some they, they knew these school staff knew the child hadn't eaten since the lunch the day before um i've had church at uh, Schools tell me that Monday they were always really hungry and they always had two bagels for their breakfast because um, the weekend had been hard for them. They don't have enough food over the weekend. I've had head teachers tell me that they had children rummaging in the bins for food before this provision came in. Um, just have a look at this quote from a member of the school medical staff at an NSBP school who said, since the NSBP started, I've had no students complaining of hunger, feeling sick or having headaches. The impact on children has been amazing. I've even had students tell me that they don't need to see me anymore as they're having breakfast in school. And there's so many more quotes and stories like that from these schools. So how can you get involved with this? Well, there's a few ways. Firstly, um, one thing that Magic Breakfast are heavily involved with is campaigning to make a change. There's huge demand. There's, there's a lot of schools on the waiting list for this support. Um, and there's a lot of funding coming in and they're always supporting new schools, but, but the demand is massive. If you go to the Magic Breakfast website and click on campaigns, you can read more about the campaigns. Um, they're calling on the government to give more funding to schools to be able to provide breakfast. And ultimately what we'd like to see is a universal free school breakfast. So every child having breakfast provided for free by the school. There's things you can do to get involved, like obviously fundraising for them, writing to your MP, things like that. The second way that you can get involved is by talking to your local school. Now, if they're already supported by the NSBP or by Magic Breakfast, um, brilliant. But um, just so you know, we just we only deliver the, the dried goods. We don't deliver the fresh items. So the school still needs to find the money for the milk, for the cereal, the butter to spread the bagels with. Um, so how great if, you're, if your church were able to donate money for that or donate big tubs of butter or, or milk each week. They also, the schools need volunteers to help them prepare the breakfast, pour the milk onto the cereal, toast the bagels. Um, and maybe you could volunteer, you know, once a week, once a month, 
um, to help with that. If the school, your local school is not supported by Magic Breakfast or the National School Breakfast Program, tell them about it. They may not have heard of it. Get them to go on the website. They can easily check to see if they're eligible and apply through a really quick form online. Um, now, the second thing to say here is that um, with funding like this from a charity, it's always temporary. Um, so funding will last for a certain length of time, usually a year, and then it will end. Now, many schools find that when their funding ends, they have a very difficult choice to make regarding their budget because they desperately want to carry on providing this free breakfast, but they just don't have the money. We know how tight things are in school budgets. I remember speaking to a school who had decided to take all the money from the school trip budget to spend on breakfast because the breakfast was just more important to feed the hungry kids. Now, if any of you are parents, I'm sure you can imagine that's not something, that's not a choice you want your school to have to be making between school trips or breakfast. The church has a unique opportunity here. When I've had conversations with schools about the longevity of their breakfast provision after the charity funding ends, they'll say, you know, finding the money, we don't have all the money in the school budget. And I'll always say to the school at that point, have you, is there a local business who you could ask to support you financially with this breakfast provision? And they say, oh, well, maybe you could ask them, maybe we could ask them. And I always say, what about your local church? Could they support you? And sadly, so many schools do not, have not considered going to their local church to ask for support, or, or they've never been approached by their local church to offer any kind of support. Wouldn't it be incredible if your church were able to support your local school in this way by providing funding or donating food items to ensure that no child in your community comes to school too hungry to learn? Okay, so the second charity that I work for um, is a fantastic Christian charity called TLG, which stands for Transforming Lives for Good. TLG are all about helping churches to bring a hope and a future to struggling children. And we have a nationwide network of partner churches and, and together we're committed to reaching out to some of the most vulnerable children in the UK. Now we run three programmes that aim to support vulnerable children with school exclusion, with poor emotional and mental health and with holiday hunger. Um, so children who who struggle in the holidays because they don't have that free school meal. And, and obviously these issues, all three of those, disproportionately affect children in poverty. And um, today I'm gonna to talk specifically about one of the programmes we run called Make Lunch. Uh, now Make Lunch provides the resources and the support to churches to run a holiday hunger club. And the club will provide free, hot and healthy meals to children and families who need it. And um, this is really important to support some of the most vulnerable children in your community and also build relationships, build community. So it's about the food, but it's also about the loving support and compassion of the church family. Now, as you can imagine, during COVID-19, the clubs haven't been able to run, but as an alternative, um, many clubs have run something called Boxes of Hope. And actually any church in the UK, whether you're a TLG partner or not, any church in the UK can get £200 of funding from TLG to run Boxes of Hope. Um, and I'm going to show you a video which will tell you a little bit more about Boxes of Hope. My name is Jonathan Hill, I'm the vicar of St Martin's Church in Hull. Previously to coming to Hull, I've been involved with TLG Make Lunch Kitchens, which is an amazing project. And moving here to Hull, we discovered a huge need. The city of Hull has some of the most deprived communities in the UK, with many families experiencing significant poverty. So I contacted TLG to see what they were doing this year and they told me about Boxes of Hope. A large parcel filled with kitchen basics, nice treats for the families and also things for the children to do and instantly we thought, 
that's the project we're going to run. And then about four weeks before the school holiday, we discovered there were going to be about 30 families from a local school who were going to be in real need of additional support. We had lots of our families who were struggling, especially due to the current situation of COVID. And we worked alongside the church and many of their very kind volunteers. We delivered weekly parcels to each of those families. We needed to be able to order a lot of food in a very short notice, so Morrisons were able to provide them with our food lists. Jonathan was giving me a shopping list of what it was. I was making sure that his stock was there, ready for the Monday morning for him. Then he'd take it and start doing his boxes and we'd pack them together with a lot of his volunteers who he's got at the church. Morrisons are going to donate the boxes of biscuits that will go in the boxes. The boxes of Hope is, is a big part of what Alison does and it's something we've been really pleased to be involved with. It's so fulfilling and you're packing a box that is going to help a family who are really vulnerable and who are in need. It was just enjoyable knowing that you're filling a box of Hope. I know that the boxes provided a lifeline for many of our families. It allowed them to build a relationship with Reverend Jonathan and the church. So it took away that fear factor. If they have needed to access support or the food bank, they feel that they can do that comfortably now. They have a really strong relationship with him. A particular family, initially they were really quite nervous of here is the vicar turning up, but by the end, it started to be able to share whole sort of things that are happening in their lives and it became really clear that actually we were probably the only adults that they were actually able to talk to. And there was one little boy who was really, really scared to leave his house. He started to come in. No one thought he'd step inside the church to actually come and get a parcel. And actually, we would, we'd give him one of the treats that we would actually give to all the volunteers. And we started to build up a really good relationship. And then he would start talking about what he'd done with the calorie or the activities in the week before. And this wasn't just here's a box of food, but here is something making a difference in people's lives. Talk to TLG, they're able to give lots of help and support. Talk to other people in your community to see how you can run this. These things are much easier to put together than people would imagine. I would just encourage everybody to get involved with Boxes of Hope as much as you can. It doesn't take a great deal of effort to make a difference. Every store has a community champion, so if we just ask to speak to them and we work as a team really. There's so much goodwill towards projects like Boxes of Hope. I'd encourage everybody to really get involved and have a go if there's need in your community. Great. Okay, so if you think that make lunch is something that you'd like to run, uh, we at TLG would provide you with all the resources and the support that you need. We can talk to you about funding um, for that. And, and, and we have um, a network of churches, like I said, doing this. So we've got all the experience of others that you can draw on. Um, and like the vicar said in that clip, it's actually a lot easier than you might think to put it together. Um, if you wanted to do boxes of hope or if, you know, after COVID, you wanted to do make lunch clubs in person. Um, or perhaps you'd like to get involved with early intervention. Now that's another program that we run that supports children who are struggling by putting volunteer coaches in schools who can provide a listening ear for a child who might be struggling, a child who's got a lack of confidence or, or no positive role models, or they just need an adult to talk to. Um, so if you're interested in either program, Make Lunch with Boxes of Hope, or early intervention, um, I'd love to chat with you. Um, or you can find out loads more, it's all on the website, tlg.org.uk. Right, we're nearly done, but um, I just wanna take a minute um, to talk to you about a couple of other charities um, that I know of who are working um, with children facing poverty. And these are ones I don't work for, just so you know I'm not completely biased. Um, so first off, Safe Families for Children are an amazing Christian organisation who offer support, hope and belonging to improve the lives of those in our local communities who need it. Um, I'm actually a volunteer with them and, and they're, they're really brilliant what they do. I love what they're doing. Um, basically, the idea is, is to help families um, who are struggling to prevent children being taken into care. Now, I know that if I was lonely, if I was struggling to cope with my children, if I didn't have enough food or I needed a friend to talk to, 
that there would be people in my church who would you know invite me around for Sunday dinner or take my kids to the park so that I could have a rest or do the food shop but what about the lonely people who don't have a church family who don't have their own family to support them with stuff like that well what say families volunteers do is support families with the practical things like that with childcare, with um, going shopping, with just being a friend, just being someone to chat to on the end of the phone. Now, um, they've recently started working in Sheffield, so that's how I've got involved with them, but they also work um, in other sites across the UK. So look them up on their website if you're interested. Um, and we've already talked about bed poverty, about the millions of children who don't have a bed to sleep on, who don't have a good quality bed to sleep on. Now, Zarak are a brilliant charity doing something about this in Leeds. And they provide beds, bedding, um, and many other things to families. You can look on their website. And even if you're not in Leeds, there are other charities doing this, or perhaps it's something that you can speak to them about starting in your area. And lastly, I just wanted to include an opportunity to get involved with a charity, which wouldn't mean leaving your house. Um, I know many of us are shielding, or there might be people in your church congregations who are and haven't been able to get out. Um, if you want to support families, who are struggling and you're not able to get out family line is like a phone line run by family action and they're a team of trained volunteers with the knowledge and experience of family issues so volunteers would support service users on the phone or maybe by text web chat email and you can do that from your own home and um, so you can go on their website family actions website to find out about that one so i just wanted to, to highlight those other few things Thank you so much for listening to me. I'm not an academic expert on child poverty, but I have an awful lot of experience of working with and for children and families who are struggling. Um, and I've done a lot of research in order to present this to you this afternoon. I hope that shows. So I'd love um, to answer any questions that you might have now, um, or if you want to share something that you're doing or something that you'd like to do, or anything that you've sort of thought of in response to what I've said. If there's questions I can't answer here, I'll take your email address and I'll get in touch. Um, but also I've stuck my email address and my Twitter handle up there. If you want to contact me, I would honestly love to hear from you. Okay, so we've got just under 10 minutes until we'll be taken back um, into the main room. So has anyone got any questions? Has any, does anyone want to share anything that they've thought of in response? I don't have a question as such, but at the, um, as a foster carer, I I often I often see what happens <coughs> when things don't work out. For it. So we see what happens when things don't work out. Mm. <laughs> they go on crying. Uh, I see what happens when things don't work out, and children come to foster care, and they may not be used <laughs> to having regular meals. Mm -hmm. So they steal food, they cram food, and you may have little ones <coughs> always have food in their cheeks. So I don't know why this makes me so <coughs> emotional. I'm not usually an emotional type like this, but just thinking of how, how real this child poverty is. And I know that my daughter works for a charity that they do hope hampers. And, and those make a real difference. So I don't really have any questions or anything. It's just that it's, it's a really real, a real life for so many families. And and what I said about generational um, poverty is that a lot of all the kids we have fostered come from a line of generation after generation of poverty, sometimes substance abuse, but not always. And to be able to help them to break that cycle and to know that there's a meal and, and there's a safe place. That's why we do what we do. And I don't know why I'm so emotional about this, but I'm not usually. Yeah. But yeah, it was a really interesting uh, view of, of this. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. And thank you for what you do as a foster carer. That's incredible. Um, I'd love to do that myself one day, but yeah, I, I definitely know what you mean. Um, it's really sad 
and and I know you're saying, oh, I don't know why I'm upset, but it's God's broken your heart for these children, hasn't he? God's put that, his heart for those children on your heart. Yes, and it's something we always wanted to do, but then when our children are, are they're growing up, we have grandkids, so that's why we do this now. It's nearly five years now, and we have our 50 newborn, who's now 14 months old. Wow. So that's what we do. Oh, that's brilliant. Thank you. Can I can I ask something? Yeah. Um, how do we know that the people that live around us are in poverty? Because so you know, as a church, we we we're not privy to you know uh, statistics in, in that sense for our local area. But you know, how how do we know about it? Um, I'm a children and youth and families worker in Wales, actually. Um, and um so i go into schools and i know the proportion of free school meals uh, and teaching is my background so i know i've taught children in, in poverty and that sort of thing because you can see it there but how as the church do we see it around us how you know how do we know those that are really struggling and in need yeah yeah really good question and i agree with you it's such a hidden problem um, especially for those families, you know, like I was talking about in that yellow category, who are in that just about managing, the children might not look dirty and, and they've got school shoes on, haven't they? And they, yeah, it's, it's really hard to tell as from the church. Um, I know you already know this, but I would say that the, the school knows, like with TLG, we go to the school for the referrals. Sometimes we go to the council, sometimes we go to the social workers, but that's a real, like a niche, um, small number. And the schools do know. Um, and if you say to the school, like when I go into schools and I talk about how many free school meals, they'll, say, they'll always say, yeah, but there's more than that. And I'll say, oh, I know. I know it's not just those 50 free school meals kids, it's the others as well. So I'd say the, the schools do know. And sometimes we were talking about this on the one this morning sometimes the school will initially say oh it's not that many it's you know it's 10 kids or whatever dig deeper with the other school staff like the inclusion staff the ta the tas and we always say ask the dinner ladies because they know who comes back for the second portion and who's mm -hmm. queuing up with the tray um they they know um, and if you dig a little deeper sometimes the head teacher doesn't know isn't aware but yeah, I, I would say the school staff as a whole, you'll know that from your background in teaching, do you know? So I would go there for referrals. Um, another thing, a volunteer that I work with in Sheffield, um, he sort of thought about, well, what would, what would families need other than food? He offered um, pre-loved school uniform. He thought, well, this is something that a family who was struggling with financially wouldn't have. So they offered pre-loved school uniform. They said, come to church, we've got all the uniform out, just take what you want, no stigma, Get, grab a carrier bag, fill it up. And they got to know the families like that. And then they offered, then they invited them to make lunch. So there's okay. other ways in, isn't there? But I, I totally agree with you that it is hard to spot. Mm. Mm. Yeah, good point, really good point. Brilliant. Anything I think, else? I, I think that's good. uniform sounds really good actually because school uniform is a difficulty isn't it the cardigans and the jumpers they've often got the badge on there because my grandchildren and it's expensive you know and you it know is. grandma buys doesn't she but if there isn't a grandma if there isn't much money it's I think yeah. that's a really good idea. yeah mm. I, I thought that was really good idea when he told me about it yeah this is the creativity of the church it's brilliant mm. I was thinking, what percentage of children do you have in those different, <laughs> on those different levels of, of poverty on the red, uh, uh, blue, on the red, green, and yellow, orange? Yeah. The percentage of children, more or less. On, yeah, yeah. On, um, I just put mute because the little one is a bit. <laughs> Got a little one in the background. Yeah, um, so the JRF um, published that there's 500,000 in that bottom red category and 4.2 million overall. I don't have the number in the yellow and the orange, sort of those middle categories, but I can find that out for you. Um, if you want to send me an email um, and I'll find that out for you. But yeah, it's a, it's a good point. 
Um, I was wondering if you had it, but okay. No, they, research as well. they, they, they don't publish those, those specific numbers in the report. And obviously the problem is that all the different charities who do these reports say different numbers. Um, but yeah, um, I, I would guess that that yellow category of that just about managing is, is the big one. And that's mm. the one that's the most hidden um, mm. that we don't know about. Mm. Great. Thank you all so much for coming. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, mm. Feel free um, to go back into the main room. It was lovely to meet you all. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.